So my name is um, Kim Oberthal. I'm a policy fellow at BASIC and managing this year's EVN policy cycle. Um, as you may know, this is our second expert masterclass. Um, it's a series intended to be an accessible source of knowledge for primarily our EVN members and eventually also the general public. Um, for now, we've set these sessions uh, up as webinars, which means that participants cannot see each other. But please don't worry, we will bring you in after um, Ray has um, made the initial presentation. And um, we will bring everyone that would like to say anything or ask anything, and we'll promote you as a panelist so you can then also speak freely. Um, so please, uh, please do note down your questions throughout the presentation. And then when it's time, please just raise your hand and we will bring you in. Um, so now I'd finally like to introduce uh, today's senior expert. Um, we are joined by Ray Ackerson, who's Director of Reaching Critical Will, the disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. They are also the author of Abolishing State Violence, A World Beyond Bombs, Borders and Cages, and Bending the Bombs, Smashing the Patriarchy. They organize for abolition and demilitarization in their work with various coalitions and provide intersectional feminist analysis and advocacy at international disarmament forums. So today, Ray is here to talk to us about one of the working group topics of the current EVN policy cycle, which is the military industrial complex. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ray and we will get those PowerPoint slides up. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I really enjoyed putting this presentation together. I never use slides, so it's um, kind of funny to me that, of course, the one time I try, it goes awry. Um, but they're not really necessary. Um, they're mostly some jokes and cartoons and some graphs that uh, help visualize what I'm talking about. But I think we can do without them if, if they never come on, it's okay. Um, so I wanted to start with a few different ideas of what the military industrial complex has meant to people over the years. And we can go back to 1915, actually, um, to World War I with the founding of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which I am part of, in its very first resolution in the midst of that war, one of the things that the women at the at that Congress um, noted was that the main impediment to ending war and building peace was the private profits that are accrued from the manufacture of armaments. So that is in their very first resolution before the concept of a military industrial complex existed. And during World War II, some UK activists and politicians, Fenner Brockway and Frederick Mullally, in a little tiny book that I recommend, hey, slides, um, that I really recommend if folks are interested, called Death Pays a Dividend from 1944, they found that one of the evils of the interwar period was the existence of an elaborately organized and financially powerful vested interest devoted to the propagation of aggressive nationalism and the multiplication of armaments. So that's some big words strewn together, um, but the sentiment is very similar to what Wilp found in 1915. And then of course, the modern conception of what the military industrial complex is, really came from US President Eisenhower in 1961, when he warned that after World War II, the United States had created an immense military establishment and a large arms industry that had accumulated unprecedented economic, political, and even spiritual influence over nearly every aspect of public and private life. And Eisenhower warned about the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power and the need to guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence of this complex. Um, and so you can see this, this slide <laughs> at this moment is just a fun cartoon. But what it really conveys is that during, and what Eisenhower was getting to was that during World War II, the US government turned on a faucet of military spending unlike any that the world had seen before. And it built a military machine involving millions of troops, uh, weapons factory workers, base construction laborers, and countless others. And while military spending did drop after World War II, 
the faucet remained open perpetually and the creation of a permanent war economy in the United States was formed. And of course, since then, we've had uh, wars, not just in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also the US military has been part of wars in Somalia, Libya, Syria, Pakistan, Yemen, the Philippines, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, Grenada, Panama, the Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Korea, among many others, that list could keep going. Um, and of course, other countries have engaged in war during this period too, and other countries have built up their own national military industrial complexes and the nuclear armed states each have uh, nuclear complexes as well. But I am going to focus on the United States in my remarks because for one thing, it is the biggest military industrial complex in the world and the biggest arms exporter in the world and engages in the most violence in the world. And secondly, it's my focus because it's where I'm situated and I've done most of my research and activism here in the US, as well as Canada, which is where I'm from originally. But this is not just a US problem. And while I'm speaking, I would really encourage each of you to think about how this plays out in your own country, especially if you're from a country that exports weapons or engages in war, or how these military industrial complexes in other countries impact your country through imperialism or weapons sales or armed conflict. So next slide, please. This is um, just going to be a little infographic. It's a bit complicated, um, but I think conveys the various parts of the military industrial complex, which is a network of many different components. Of course, the military, is involved, but also weapons manufacturers, um, the companies that make weapons, and also increasingly, it should be noted, tech companies are part of the military industrial complex when they're contracted to work on autonomous weapons or artificial intelligence weapons, uh, cyber warfare, et cetera. So that core nature of, of weapons manufacturers is expanding right now. The complex also includes private military and security companies, it involves Congress, which approves budgets and makes decisions. Um, it involves politicians, especially those that have some of these weapons contractors in their districts. It involves lobbyists who are paid large sums of money in order to lobby Congress to um, give more money back to the military industrial complex. Um, it also, in many conceptions now, includes the entertainment industry. If you think of all the wars, and, or sorry, all of the movies and video games, that really promote uh, war and conflict and celebrate the militarized um, masculinities and the, the sort of the heroism of, of war and violence and of guns. Um, it also includes academics that support the military industrial complex. And um, many of these are actually funded by weapons contractors. Uh, so some universities or individual academics get money to collaborate with the Department of Defense or directly with weapons contractors like Lockheed Martin, et cetera. Um, universities get research centers funded. There's often pipelines between engineering or science programs and these weapons manufacturers. Um, so I think the, the point that that this graphic and that I'm trying to make here is that this is not just about the military and the industry. It has a lot of different components that have really been bolstered over time heading uh, in, in one direction. Um, uh, next slide, please. So military spending goes to a lot of private companies uh, in the United States that provide goods, including weapons and services to the military as contractors. So the major um, top five US weapons manufacturers, which are Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon, they dominate the international arms market. They dominate the profits being made um, in the United States and internationally. And this chart from CIPRI um, sort of shows some of the top uh, corporations that are profiting from, from war and violence around the world. The current US military budget, and I'm gonna get into spending in detail later on, the current budget will give about $452 billion to private companies. So contractors account for about 53% of the authorized military spending in the United States this year. So more than half of 
that huge military budget that we hear about is going to weapons contractors um, and private companies. And then, of course, these companies reinvest this money into um, lobbying, political contributions, donations to think tanks, um, all of which helps to shape a hyper-militarized approach to U.S. foreign policy. And contractors also work to ensure that their manufacturing takes place in as many congressional districts as possible. Um, Congress members really like the jobs that are associated with military spending, but it's important to note that research has shown, extensive research repeatedly in the United States has shown that military spending creates far fewer jobs compared to spending on healthcare, education, or green infrastructure. Um, and I'd recommend the Costs of War Project at Brown University if you're interested in, in some of that. So there's really a snowball effect in relation to the accumulation of capital and the production of violence through the military industrial complex. And as the complex has grown since the end of World War II, it has systematically diverted money, labor, and energy away from pressing human needs in the United States and globally. So next slide, please. Um, U.S. corporations continue to dominate the international arms market. Um, so this isn't just about domestic production, but also um, selling weapons to other countries. The U.S. currently sells weapons to at least 96 countries, which is far more than any other supplier. Um, and it dominates uh, who is exporting weapons abroad. Um, the arms industry is approximately a $530 billion business. So there's a lot of money here. Um, next slide. And this, during the pandemic, um, oh, that just skipped to the end. <laughs> uh, in the pandemic, the weapons manufacturers were treated as essential services. There was actually an increase of more than 1% of arms sales in 2020, despite a more than 3% contraction of the global economy. That's a CIPRI figure. Um, and so uh, we can see that, you know, the interests of the military industrial complex right now driving forward the conflict in Ukraine, the stocks of the weapons contractors has have, have gone up the longer that the war has gone on. Um, I remember early last year, uh, listening to the CEO of Raytheon talk really enthusiastically um, about all the new countries that were engaging in drone strikes and uh, discussing the rising returns coming from heightened US-Russia and US-China tensions. So there's no attempt to hide uh, their glee with um, rising prospect of, of conflict. Um, and during the, um, the beginning of uh, Russia's reinvasion of, of Ukraine last year, also nuclear strategists in the U.S. were clamoring for increased funding for the modernization of U.S. nuclear forces, which already gets almost $50, $50 billion a year in, in, in money. Um, military spending globally went up during the pandemic. Um, so CIPRI calculated a 2.6 increase um, in 2020, and for the first time in 2021, global military spending passed $2 trillion. Nuclear weapons spending also went up during the pandemic. Uh, figures from ICANN account for an increase of over a billion dollars during the pandemic. Um, and by 2021, the spending was $82.4 billion uh, for the nine nuclear armed states. Um, next slide. And so while a lot of countries are spending a lot of money on militarism, the US continues to outdo everybody. In 2021, the US Senate authorized $858 billion in military spending, which is one of the highest levels since World War II. And it's actually $45 billion more than the White House even proposed. And as noted earlier, more than half of that will go to contractors. So the Cost of War Project at Brown University has shown that a lot of this growth in the US military budget since 2001 and the launch of the quote unquote global war on terror is due to payments to military contractors, um, including not just the weapons manufacturers, but also the private security companies, private military and security companies. Um, and there's a long track record of human rights abuses for many of these companies from DynCor in Bosnia to Blackwater in Iraq and many others. Um, and so in addition to 
executing military services, a lot of these companies also handle things like laundry and food services and transportation and construction at U.S. military bases abroad. They often employ foreign nationals and pay them yet less than U.S. employees. So there's, again, a lot of different elements to exploitation and harm created by these contractors. Um, the U.S. is spending more than the next 10 countries combined on its military. It spends about 38 percent of global military spending, um, which you can see in this uh, graphic here. But the U.S. actually spends a lot more than this on militarism. So we have the military budget and we have the nuclear weapon budget, which we've covered both of those. So then we also, on top of this, have uh, the US intelligent budget. They have 16 different agencies, and that's another um, 85 billion or so a year. This money does not go through the Pentagon and it isn't calculated as being part of US military spending. It's a black budget and it grows every year. It's really hard to track. The Washington Post did um, in some investigation on it a few years ago, which is how we have that figure. Um, then about $50 billion a year goes to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, which was created in 2003. Um, and U.S. Customs and Border Protection currently receives $18.2 billion. Um, and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, known as ICE, gets about um, $9 billion a year. So these are other... Um, agencies of the U.S. government that are heavily militarized um, and part of the military industrial complex, but not in 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 this broader uh, framing, but not part of the military budget. So over the last 20 years or so of the global war on terror, um, as the U.S. calls it, there's been about two trillion dollars to the weapons companies, hundreds of billions to private military and security companies, eight trillion overall for the wars, and about twenty. It's about twenty trillion all told if you include all the funding for the domestic militarism, like Department of Homeland Security and ICE, police and surveillance, etc. Now, of course, this is not just an issue of money. Uh, deaths and injuries and displacement and uh, myriad other harms from U.S. warfare reach into the tens of millions of people. And in the last 20 years alone, the military industrial complex has helped drive this war on terror that has killed an estimated four and a half million, injured tens of millions and displaced 38 million. And again, these are all from the Costs of War Project at Brown. Um, the total cost of these wars extends to the US military carbon footprint as well, which is larger than that of any organization on earth. Between 2001 and 2021, the military emitted 1.2 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases, which is more than twice the annual emissions of the nearly 300 million cars in the United States. So I know I'm going through this very quickly, but I can also provide links and things like that after um, this this talk, but I think it's just important to recognize all these different facets of the military industrial complex. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we talked a little bit about the money spent on nuclear weapons, but I think it's also important to dig into the nuclear weapon complex specifically a bit. Uh, this map is old um, from several years ago, but it's still basically accurate and it accounts for in the United States the nuclear weapon labs, uh, uranium mines, reprocessing sites, um, various elements of the nuclear complex. This map does not account for where missiles and bombers and nuclear submarines are based, which are at sites all over the country. And it's really difficult to read those maps um, because they're just scattered across the whole country. Um, the same private corporations run these sites and build the weapons. So Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Bechtel, et cetera, they manage the nuclear weapon labs. They're involved in constructing nuclear weapons. So they're not just about the conventional arms trade. Um, they're also very much deeply embedded in this complex as well. And I think it's important to highlight the imperial and colonial nature of the nuclear weapon complex. Most of these sites are on indigenous land uh, or they're near poor communities or they have a history of segregation, racially racial segregation of workers at the sites, um, disproportionate harms to, to communities that are known as downwinders that are often indigenous communities. 
nuclear weapons have been tested mostly on indigenous land. So many of you may have heard of the Nevada test site in the United States. That's the land of the Western Shoshone, and they're known as the most bombed nation on Earth. Um, there's also, of course, nuclear testing in the Pacific that the U.S. and, and other nuclear armed states conducted. So there is a whole um, big legacy uh, that needs to be accounted for in the, in the nuclear complex as well. Next slide. And the last bit that I want to talk about here in terms of what the complex is um, includes U.S. military basis. And this is another imperialist and colonialist aspect to the military industrial complex. The United States currently has about 750 military bases in 80 countries and colonies around the world. This is three times more than it has embassies or consulates uh, or other such agencies around the world. It's also three times more overseas bases as all other countries combined in the world. Uh, it costs about $55 billion a year to maintain, and there's been more than $100 billion in construction over the last two decades. These bases uh, have been used to launch wars and military operations uh, in at least 25 countries since 2001. There are many harms uh, associated with these bases in terms of sexual violence, trafficking, uh, and other harms caused to local communities from these bases, as well as the displacement of uh, local people. Um, so a lot of these statistics, if you're interested, are drawn from David Vine's work uh, in the book Base Nation um, and the coalition that uh, he and others maintain to call for uh, the shutdown of, of U.S. foreign military bases. So all of this the, uh, really creates sort of an omniscient military presence in the world, which is part of the U.S. pursuit of full spectrum dominance, uh, which is the ability to deploy violence anywhere in the world at any time, at a moment's notice. And I think of this as being part of the U.S., historical concept of, of manifest destiny uh, internally in terms of colonization and settler colonies, but on a global scale. And it's all about this belief that the US can and should be the world's police force. That's what's behind um, the political economy of, of the military industrial complex. That's sort of how it's sold uh, to, to the US population. And so, in my conception of the military industrial complex, it's tied directly then to policing at home and the construction of a national security state as well as this global police force. Um, so we're gonna go to the next slide, please, and look uh, a little bit at policing. Um, across uh, the US, um, some police forces take up between 30 to 60% of uh, a city's budget. Um, as a whole, the United States spends about $118 billion annually on policing, and this is a fairly shocking statistic in that it makes U.S. policing the third largest military spender in the world if it were calculated um, on a list, and so that slide is up now. Um, the New York Police Department, I live in New York City, it has the biggest uh, policing budget in the U.S., um, it's currently nearly $12 billion, um, and that would make it the 33rd largest military spending in the world. So the NYPD, 33rd largest military. Um, policing is uh, separate, of course, from the military industrial complex, just like ICE and Department of Homeland Security. But it is important to think about police in the context of the military industrial complex because of how militarized these forces are. So there's a few different programs in the United States that allow transfer of military equipment directly to police forces. Um, there's at least two of those programs that are still active today. Um, and despite rampant police violence and brutal murders of unarmed black people in particular across the country, despite demands to defund and abolish police, police budgets have actually gone up since 2020 and have become even more militarized. Um, militarized police have used force against um, land and water protectors and forest defenders, such as at Line 3 and Standing Rock, um, and now at Cop City. Um, in 
2014 in Ferguson, some of you may recall that tanks were deployed in the streets um, after uprisings, again, against uh, police killing um, of black men. And so this has uh, become a fixture in, in US policing. And I wanna zero in on Cop City, which I just mentioned as a specific example of, of how this is unfolding and, and how this can help us see policing as part of the military industrial complex. So um, for those that aren't aware, uh, the Atlanta City Council has approved the construction of a facility that they call a public safety training facility. Um, activists call it Cop City. Uh, it's going to be a place where police forces from all over the United States and globally uh, will be trained in military tactics and on military equipment to fight urban warfare. So it's basically a mock city that they're creating um, where people will practice fighting, uh, fighting people. Um, it is funded by taxpayers, but also many private corporations. And so the activists and organizers that have been working on this have been very clear um, that this is uh, you know, obviously, as it's being funded by by taxpayers and will train uh, cops from all over the world, um, it really is about repression more than anything else, um, including in the midst of the climate crisis and an uprising against police brutality and inequality and poverty um, that we see in the United States and globally. It also mirrors what the U.S. militarism and border enforcement does. So it's, you know... Um, in terms of uh, maintaining private profits and fossil fuel extraction and inequalities, it's similar to US military training um, police and troops in other countries, often on indigenous and colonized lands, such as in Puerto Rico and other places around the world. It relates to the cooperation that US police already have with um, the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, so there's a lot of different elements again here at play. And I think it's something that anyone concerned about militarism and the military industrial complex needs to have on their radar. Um, and of course, all of this policing leads to mass incarceration. So next slide, please. Um, and so that brings us to the prison industrial complex, which very deliberately took that terminology from, um, uh, oops, sorry, I forgot. So you can skip the cop city one, I already talked about that. Uh, and yeah, so now we're on prison industrial complex. Um, so they they deliberately took the term, uh, PIC abolitionists took the term from the military industrial complex. And here's uh, a description from critical resistance, which focuses on the overlapping interests of government and industry related to surveilling policing and imprisonment. Um, and so there's a lot of different writing that has uh, been done on the prison industrial complex, including from an abolitionist perspective from Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Miriam Kaba, um, and many, many other folks. Uh, a lot of the best work on, on it is done by Black feminists. Um, and I can, again, recommend readings for anyone interested. Um, but the uh, in terms of funds, the official budget for incarceration in the United States today is 81 billion, um, but there's a lot of other hidden costs again. So the prison policy initiative has calculated that the annual total cost of incarceration in the United States is about $182 billion. Uh, so next slide, please. And just like we can map out the military industrial complex, we can also uh, map out prison industrial complex complexes. So here's an example um, of what that could look like in a, in a generic form. And then if you switch to the next uh, slide, there's a specific example from Atlanta that Micah Hirschkin did, who's an abolitionist organizer in Atlanta. Um, and so he's sort of mapped out the different elements um, in the city that are involved in uh, the prison industrial complex. I also want to highlight that um, there's a lot of private military and security companies that we talked about in the context of more traditional militarism that also have their hooks into the prison industrial complex or into border enforcement. So these companies are all entangled. So G4 Security Solutions is a good example. Um, it has contracts with Israeli prisons in the West Bank, uh, South African prisons, and Guantanamo Bay. It also provides transportation for ICE in the United States. 
and guards nuclear weapon and nuclear power facilities throughout the US and has been implicated in many security breaches and lapses at those sites. So that's another element to keep involved if you're doing research on complexes is who is involved in more than one thing because often they, they are. So next slide, please. This is where we get to the exciting action. Um, all of this connection, interconnection, I understand it can make things seem even more overwhelming. Like we can't just focus on one thing. There's too much, it's too big. But I actually find the interconnection to be a source of hope. I think it really speaks to the need for a combined effort of disarmament, demilitarization, decolonization, decarbonization, degrowth politics, um, all through the lens of abolition. So when I talk about abolition, I am talking about um, an origin of a concept that began with the abolition of slavery in the United States and in the United Kingdom and in other places around the world. And so this concept of, abolish, of abolition as applied to slavery, but also applied to these other systems and structures of harm is both about deconstructing the system that's causing harm or oppression and building up alternative systems that are based on care and community and equality in its place. So it's not just about tearing down, it's also about building up. And I find the work and the concepts and philosophy of abolition so useful in our work because it really helps us to see that while we're di divesting from um, the military industrial complex, the nuclear weapon complex, the prison industrial complex, we're instead looking to how we can invest in the common good. So for the military industrial complex, this can mean focusing on divesting um, and stigmatizing and uh, abolishing the weapons manufacturers. So. ICANN has its Don't Bank on the Bomb initiative. Um, Code Bink has a Divest from the War Machine initiative. Um, there's a lot of different other uh, campaigns like that underway already. There's lawsuits that can be done against uh, military contractors uh, or governments selling weapons, making a profit um, off of conflict abroad. So in the United Kingdom, campaign against arms trade is suing the UK government for its weapon sales to Saudi Arabia that are being used uh, in Yemen to commit human rights abuses and international humanitarian law abuses. There's also a lot of direct action that can happen against these um, contractors and weapons manufacturers. So dissenters, um, RAM Inc., Canada's labor against the arms trade, the nuclear resistors, the Catholic workers. There's a long tradition of folks that are engaged in um, sit-ins, die-ins, um, climbing up on top of facilities, dropping banners, uh, blocking roads, um, port blockages also for the shipment of weapons. There's also student organizing going on right now against connections between their universities and the military industrial complex. So Think Outside the Bomb used to do this a lot in the United States related to nuclear weapons. There's ICANN School of Mass Destruction Initiative. Um, there's UK work going on right now at UK universities against contracts with the um, with autonomous weapon development. So this is work that is happening already and that folks can, can plug into. Um, and I think the other important aspect of this is then connecting up working collectively with or in solidarity with other movements because of these moral and material connections between all the different structures of harm that we're confronting. So if we go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, so they, there's some collaborations already going on. So the Red Nation is an indigenous coalition here in the US that they've developed a red deal which builds on the Green New Deal and hooks up decolonization with um, environmental justice. Um, there's COVID care structures that were outlined by critical resistance, the Red Nation and a bunch of other groups uh, during the earlier days of COVID. Um, there's the campaign to abolish the war on terror which reflects both the military bases and the war abroad um, with domestic surveillance and terrorization of Muslim communities within the United States and looks at um, how to uh, target both of those elements. There's the ways in which those that are working against uh, borders and 
uh, violence against migrants, are working with those who are working against the prison industrial complex. And so there are people are making these connections and have this um, analysis. And I think that on the side of those working against war and the military industrial complex and nuclear weapons need to find ways to plug into this work um, increasingly, because I think that in general, the abolitionists have a very strong analysis of systemic harm and strategies for, for overcoming it that we can learn a lot from. Um, so next slide, we're almost at the end. Um, and if you are interested, there's a lot of books and resources out there. As I said, I can share some links um, through the EVN organizers later on if you're interested. Um, Haymarket Books has a lot of great uh, tools that you can use, study guides as well as, as books. Um, so I wanted to recommend them, but also PM Press and US, AK Press in the UK and a variety of others. So next slide, this is uh, the end of our, our adventure. Um, and so I wanted to turn to your questions, of course, or clarifications on anything that I've presented, but I also wanted to ask you some questions um, for answering now, if you feel that you can, or for reflection, for a bit of homework for yourself to think through some of these issues. So what does the military industrial complex look like in your country? What are its components to do that kind of mapping exercise that we talked about? What are some of the links between the military industrial complex and other structures of state violence in your local or national or regional context? So this can include the elements that I've talked about, like prisons, policing, border enforcement. It can include many other things, um, but it's a creative exercise to think through these connections. And then also, of course, what initiatives or organizations um, and movements exist already to challenge the military industrial complex or these other structures of state violence within your country? And what are some of the ways that you might want to engage with them or other initiatives that you feel are missing and you would like to initiate? So I'm going to stop there. And yeah, happy to hear some answers if anybody has some ready to go, um, but also happy to, to take any questions. Thank, thank you so much, Ray. Um, it was a really interesting presentation. And of course, um, we're happy to share any links that you may have after the session. Um, but yeah, so now to all of you. So um, now is the time to think about uh, the questions that Ray just mentioned. Um, do you have anything you already would like to comment on, or do you have any questions that um, about the presentation that Ray just made? Um, we can bring you in, we can um, um, promote you to a panelist, and then we can hear and see you speak as well. So please do come in, just raise your hand and we can bring you in. Um, if you do need another minute to think about these questions, that's not a problem. Um, perhaps we can take any other questions in the meantime, if you already have any. I just see Yasmin just raised her hand, um, so I'll bring them in. Yasmin, if you can hear us, just um, um, unmute yourself, then feel free. Exactly, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, Ray, thank you so much for this presentation. I found it so informative. And I also just love how throughout it all, uh, you are constantly uplifting and centering the voices and impacts on Black women, Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color in general. Um, but I wanted to ask, you had mentioned how um, some uh, organizations and whatnot are, uh, have been like filing lawsuits against um, companies and whatnot involved in the military industrial complex. And I was curious if you could just talk more about that. I'm I like, I guess I'm just curious how that works and how, um, like what is, I guess the standing that these organizations have to file this lawsuit. Um, I guess I just hadn't really been aware that like that was a possibility. So I'm curious to learn more about that. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the example that I mentioned is happening in the UK right now, but I think I, as far as I know, this can also be done in the United States and should be. Um, and so it's it's um, it's a lawsuit about the arms trade. And so the United Kingdom is selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. 
Um, the United Nations and many other investigators have found uh, very clear violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law um, occurring from the use of these weapons. Um, but the UK government has said that it is in full compliance with its obligations under both the International Arms Trade Treaty, which was adopted at the UN in 2013, and the UK has ratified. Um, it also says it's in compliance. This was before Brexit, but in compliance with the EU regulations on arms transfers as well. So Campaign Against Arms Trade, which is a NGO, a nonprofit in the UK, um, hired a law firm um, to take the UK government to court. Um, they've done, they've, there's been a series of hearings and I can, um, uh, point you to the, uh, to the, their website on that. So you can see the different filings and how the hearings have gone on that. Um, and so there's been arguments, of course, about, um, jurisdiction and viability, but then also arguments and hearings about the substance and the merits of the case, um, the, this is still in process, so we don't know yet if it's going to be successful or not. Um, but I think uh, like many other tactics and strategies that we have at our disposal as um, as organizers and activists is really to make things as difficult as possible for the people that are causing harm in the world, right? So um, it's it's airing this in the public, it's, it's being able to bring in impacted communities, including in this case, there's a Yemeni group that is part of the lawsuit as well. Um, um, and there's, you know, chances for them to speak during these hearings and submit filings and briefs to the court. Um, and it creates this body of uh, knowledge and material that can then be used as a precedent in other cases, especially if it's a successful lawsuit. Um, so yeah, I think there's some real interest in this in this work. And I think that um, it would be useful in the US context to also think about how to do that. I do think one of the most important elements of the work is um, having the case be brought also by folks who are impacted. So if it's a weapon sale, like in this context, that is creating harm in another country, um, then having their voices lead the uh, the initiative is crucial. Um, but it's also something that um, folks on this end in the United States can be very involved in because this is where the weapons are being produced and this is where the court discussions would happen, et cetera. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I'm going to bring Melinda in next. Uh, Melinda, if you can um, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, um, we can. So, uh, so I guess my question is, uh, I guess like the military industrial complex is also very strongly related to how much of a advanced industrial economy a country has, uh, in my view. Uh, I'm just wondering, like for other countries, so for example, where I'm from, I'm from Sri Lanka, and um, our, our military, uh, the military is tied to, so in terms of it, in, its continuation to eat up the national budget and taking away funding from other social services and other public services is tied to also other concerns, which are not purely based, purely, uh, based on maintaining a, a military industrial sector because we don't have one in a significant capacity but it's also actually just maintain uh, making sure that a lot of um, youth are continuously employed and and at the same time part of that military is also used as a political weapon uh, uh, for repression uh, I was just wondering if you could share some thoughts on on a country like Sri Lanka, for example, uh, in terms of how to advance a public conversation around um, uh, changing this dynamic and um, trying to get the public to see um, the, the the need to uh, either uh, to, to basically reduce military expenditure. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it I think it starts with the mapping exercise, right? So if the industrial element isn't 
uh, a really strong factor in your country, which in many places it's not. In many places, weapons are are predominantly imported as opposed to manufactured. Um, so it, it would be about mapping the other elements of militarism within the country. So um, you could look at the the imports of weapons, the budget that's spent on that. You could do um, some work looking at, so you said one of the arguments in favor of militarism was jobs for youth. So you could look at um, what the comparative costs are for creating jobs in other sectors, um, which in the US has consistently, as I mentioned, proven that investments in basically anything else create more jobs um, and uh, than uh, the military industrial complex does uh, dollar for dollar. So you could do a you know, you could do a study like that. You could look at other um, cultural uh, militarism arguments as well um, and try and confront those, um, you know, sort of Eisenhower's uh, discussion of the military industrial complex being, he used the word spiritual. Um, I wouldn't necessarily use that word, but I understand what he means in that sense. It becomes part of the ethos of the culture of the of the country. And so you can also confront those elements, whether it's through entertainment, whether it's through popular culture um, or um, education. And if, are there ways to have conversations around those elements of, of the military industrial complex within your country? So those are just a few ideas. But I think, I think the mapping exercise is really useful for anybody starting to think about how this plays out in their own context. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Um, and I'll bring in Aurea next. Thank you. Hi, Ray. Hi, Kim. Um, thanks, Ray, for your presentation. It's been really great and enlightening as usual. Um, I have a few questions, um, and I wanted to tap into your experience with advocacy on nuclear issues. And when we are, for example, trying to address um, the issues that, that you clearly illustrated about the military industrial complexes hold on policy and everything, um, we can either focus, for example, our efforts, I mean, not specifically, but if we had to focus our efforts, it should be like, for example, towards civic society or um, the diplomatic community. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the pitfalls or, or like the pros and cons of addressing each sort of like audience for the for the for, for example like a policy paper or something and a secondary question which is a bit broader um you talked about the US military complex um but i was wondering for example how do you see them intertwine with western or even global military industrial complexes in general thank you Yes. Um, so I'll start with your first and I'll probably forget your second by the time that I finish. So um, feel free to remind me. But um, uh, yeah, so on the different audiences, um, I think, again, this depends on the context in which you're working and um, the type of environment that you're working within, whether you're, you know, within a nonprofit or an academic institution or and you're an educator or um, working in some other sector, you know, I think it really, that can really vary. I think in, and the country that you're in can also affect that too, right? Like the US um, sort of political decision-making apparatus is um, um, so massive that it can be very hard to, and entrenched, that it can be very hard to um, infiltrate. Whereas, uh, a lot of other countries that have smaller foreign service and smaller um, smaller group of people that are working on these types of decisions, um, you can actually have greater access to. So that is also another variable. Um, so I've done most of my work, of course, around the UN. So when it comes to talking with governments, I'm usually talking to diplomats. And in that situation, um, you know, part of our strategy has been to approach from an angle of stigmatizing um, and building up uh, alternative norms, challenging the norms that exist and overturning them and building up new norms in their place, um, developing international law to that regard, such as the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, such as the Arms Trade Treaty, uh, the bans on cluster munitions and landmines, etc. So that has been one approach, and it's relied on um, 
us working with countries that are not in those cases the worst offenders in order to change discourse and change and change law and then having that have an impact on the worst offenders so the way that the bans on cluster munitions and landmines have actually impacted the way these are manufactured, used, transferred, et cetera, um, by the worst offenders, uh, as well as those who are states parties. Um, and so we're still at the earlier stages of that with the nuclear uh, ban at the moment. But I think that um, in, a, in an alternative circumstance where you don't have that kind of access um, and you're maybe working within a context like the United States where the foreign policy elite, the military industrial complex elite um, is not, uh, there isn't ways to access or, or change minds or um, have uh, much influence. And I think focusing on public perception and stigmatization at that level is extremely useful. Um, mobilizing, um, mobilizing folks to dismantle the manufactured consent to use a Noam Chomsky term that has been created around the military industrial complex. There is such a, in the United States and in other countries, there's such a reverence for militarism and an assumption that it is absolutely necessary. And I think that disrupting that public um, perception of militarism is extremely crucial. And we can see this having happened for example, around policing um, with the uprisings of Black Lives Matter at different points, um, you know, in 2014 in Ferguson, as I said, and, and at different points, and of course, with the 2020 uprisings as well, were another um, major moment for this and really challenging people's assumptions about what the police are for, what the police do, and the reality of, of all the money going to police and what that has cost um, so many different communities in the country, especially communities of color. And so, um, again, like with all movements, right, we never solve anything in, in one go, but we make, we build ground, we face pushback, we build ground in other ways. This building up new discourse and new understandings and public opinion is an extremely challenging and long-term project, but it can have moments where you can really push things forward um, at incredible speed. And so always doing the work um, in advance so that you're ready to go when these moments do happen, um, then is is extremely important. And with rising fascism um, in the US and globally, this is particularly important as well to hold ground, to keep pushing um, across a range of issues. Uh, and so I think that in many contexts, that is the probably going to be the strategy that will be more effective. But like I said, there's so many variables, so it's difficult to to answer that. And then in terms of, I did remember your second question, in terms of um, connections between the US military complex and others, I think that, um, yeah, the so the US, of course, is part of many different military alliances. It's part of um, NATO. It's got alliances with Japan and South Korea. It's starting the new AUKUS alliance with Australia and the UK. Um, it has, like I said, it's 750 mil military bases globally. It trains troops. Uh, around the world. It trains police forces around the world. So it's very connected and embedded within um, other militaries and other military industrial complexes globally. The manufacturers as well are also connected transnationally. So like, you know, Canadian um, factories for Lockheed Martin, or, you know, that happens in other countries as well. So I think that's another excellent mapping exercise if you do live external to the U.S. is to, to try and find out how the U.S. military is involved in your country and how it's influencing then your country's foreign policy on this basis and your country's political economy. Thank you so much, uh, Ray and Orion. We have one more, uh, one final question, which perhaps you can give just a, a brief um, reply to as we're almost out of time. But Irene, um, she mentioned another question. So she's saying, um, uh, are there any cases or examples of retaliation towards activists fighting the military industrial complex? And how is this prevented? And also what are the tactics used by diplomats, governments, members to find the to fight the military industrial complex from the inside? Thank you. I don't know that I can answer these two questions in three minutes, um, but I think, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's the same 
uh, reactions to a lot of activists fighting the military industrial complex as there are to, to organizers and activists working across a range of issues, especially if you're involved in direct action, that is where the most risk tends to lie in terms of getting arrested. And if you're not a citizen, then getting deported or, um, you know, facing harassment and surveillance from, from police. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think we all need to be um, paying a lot of attention to Cop City and getting involved in the movement to stop Cop City because they're training forces to suppress dissent. That is, um, in my mind, in the mind of organizers working on this, the key thing this facility is meant to do. It's not like there aren't others, but this is going to be a, a massive one. Um, and we have a chance to stop it, which is also um, rare. Uh, and so I think um, that would be my quick answer to the first part. Um, but tactics used by diplomats and governments to fight the military industrial complex from the inside. I think, again, this has a lot of dependency on, on context. Um, for diplomats, it's really about changing their own foreign policy. Um, and so a lot of foreign policy, we think of it when we're taught about it in school would be, you know, comes from the prime minister or the president down to the foreign minister and down to the diplomats. But a lot of it actually works the other way. So that's one of the um, interesting things that I've found working around the UN is that a lot of diplomats can have influence within their own systems. The other tactic I would say is regional solidarity is extremely important, especially when the colonial powers come for you. So in the um, during the process to develop the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, a lot of Francophone African countries were put under pressure by the government of France. Other African countries were put under pressure by the US and the UK. Um, it was all very overtly colonial. Um, and so one of the ways that they were able to push back on this was having regional solidarity um, through uh, different networks at, at the UN and also with um, uh, local campaigners and organizations within their own countries, not just at the UN internationally, in order to, to push back on some of this pressure. So I think that is another important tactic. Well, thank you so much, Ray. Thank you so much for answering um, all these really interesting questions. Thank you to everyone that uh, participated today in, in you know, um, bringing up these questions and listening to you. Um, this really interesting discussion on the military industrial complex. Um, I just um, would like to say they were unfortunately out of time, um, but we will share any links um, and anything that you perhaps think would be useful. Um, so thank you for everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to those who are watching this uh, recording online. Uh, we hope that this was an interesting and helpful session that provided some insights into examining and abolishing the military industrial complex and that you were able to take some questions and ideas away from it. So thank you, Ray, for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, and yeah, thanks again. And we hope that everyone else um, joins us for uh, our other upcoming masterclasses, including the one next week, which is on race, social justice, and nuclear weapons. So bound to be another really interesting one. Thank you so much. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening, and um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.